Hi again, this is Andy, KE4GKP, and welcome back to the Ham Whisperer and Lesson 34 in the General Class Operator Element 3 exam course. In this lesson, we cover the G0A section of questions from the General Class Question Pool. The G0A section of questions covers RF safety principles, rules and guidelines, and routine station evaluation. So basically, the theme of this section is how to determine how much RF energy you are exposing yourself and those around you to and how to take measures to prevent that. So RF safety guidelines is the theme of the G0A questions and with that said, let's get started with the review. What is one way that RF energy can affect human body tissue? Well, it can heat body tissue. So exposure to RF energy heats body tissues and this just in the same theory that a microwave will heat whatever you're cooking in the microwave, RF energy will heat your body tissue. So if the frequency, intensity, and exposure are just right, RF energy can cause burns and other damage to your body parts. So this is why it's important to monitor how much RF energy is being emitted in your ham shack and around your antenna to see if it'll, it'll affect yourself, your family, or your neighbors. So the majority of arm, our amateur radio activity is safe. However, there are activities that expose more RF energy to your environment than others. So it's, in, it's important to monitor how much RF energy your station is emitting. Which property is not important in estimating if an RF signal exceeds the maximum permissible exposure or MPE? Well the answer that is not important as far as the RF signal exposure goes is the RF signal's critical angle. So now when we're talking about RF exposure levels and safety there are three big areas to be concerned about and that's the length of time of exposure, the power of the signal, and the frequency of the signal. So basically the period of time your body is exposed to RF energy and the factors of the signal's strength, how powerful it is, and the signal's frequency are how you determine your RF energy exposure and the mass maximum permissible exposure limits. So if you remember from the technician exam, the human body will resonate at certain frequencies. So if you're basically transmitting within the frequency range, you are going to cause a lot more damage to your body as far as RF energy exposure goes than you would at other frequencies. The power and the length of exposure also common sense would factor into that. An example is 30 minutes of exposure to a 100 watt signal in the 80 meter band may not be anything. However, but 30 minutes of a 20 watt signal in the 6 meter band may do a lot more damage through RF ex energy exposure. So the only possible answer that has nothing to do with any of these factors is the critical angle. And the critical angle is more of a propagation thing and deals with um, how far the signal travels over the horizon and whatnot. So the critical angle is the only category or the only possible answer on for this question that has nothing to do with RF exposure and maximum permissible exposure limits. Which of the following has the most direct effect on the permitted exposure level of RF radiation? The answer is the power level and the frequency of the energy. And this kind of goes in the same theme as the last question. Of the possible answers, the power level and frequency have the biggest effect on RF exposure levels. Remember from the technician exam that, like we are talking about, the human body resonates at certain frequencies. The correct answer is the only one with frequency in it. So that might help get you the right answer. But of the possible answers, power level and frequency of the energy have the biggest effect, effect on the permitted exposure level of RF radiation. What does time averaging mean in reference to RF radiation exposure? Well, time averaging is the total RF exposure averaged over a certain time. And since most amateurs don't transmit constantly, so you're transmitting and receiving, RF exposure is measured with an average. So basically over a period of time, um, based on the frequency and the power that you're transmitting, and the amount of time you're transmitting versus the amount of time you're listening, that goes into a formula and produces the time average of your RF exposure. Now there are a lot of rules which kind of contribute to how this time average is determined, which you don't need to worry about for the exam. But the total RF exposure averaged over a certain time is time averaging. What must you do if an evaluation of your station shows RF energy radiated from your station exceeds permissible limits? The answer is to take action to prevent human exposure to excessive RF fields. And this is a simple answer. Whenever you have a problem with RF energy radiated from your station exceeding the permissible limits, you fix the problem. 
So don't worry about the other noise as far as the other questions go or the other possible answers. The simple answer is just to fix the problem. So take action to prevent human exposure to excessive RF fields. Don't overthink the, the question. Which transmitters at a multiple user site is or are responsible for RF safety compliance? The answer is any transmitter that contributes 5% or more to the maximum permissible exposure. Now, th this is a very strange question, and it's in no way, shape, or form a straightforward answer to the question. When multiple transmitters are transmitting from the same site, any transmitter that contributes 5% or more of the maximum permissible exposure limit is responsible for making sure our exposure is safe. Now, there, this question is a lot deeper than it appears because there's a lot more criteria that kind of go into you know, who's responsible and what exactly 5% of the MPE is. But for the purpose of the exam, it's probably best just to memorize that anyone who contributes 5% or more of the MPE is responsible for RF safety compliance. So 5% is the number you need to remember to get this question correct. What effect does transmitter duty cycle have when evaluating RF exposure? The answer is a lower transmitter duty cycle permits greater short-term exposure levels. So duty cycle is basically the ratio of transmitting versus receiving. And the less you transmit and the more you listen, the lower the transmitter's duty cycle. So because of the increased time between RF exposures when transmitting, greater short-term exposure levels are allowed. So basically, the more you listen and the less you transmit, the longer you're allowed to be exposed to RF energy. And that's basically because your body, the tissues that get heated, cool, and your body recovers basically from the exposure in between you know, the, the blasts of RF energy you're giving it. So a lower transmitter duty cycle permits greater short-term exposure levels. Which of the following steps must an amateur operator take to ensure compliance with RF safety regulations? The answer is to perform a routine RF exposure evaluation. Now this is a common sense answer compared to the other possible answers. The other answers deal with posting rules and regulations which will tell you nothing about whether your station is actually radiating yourself and neighbors. So basically you want to perform a routine RF exposure evaluation. Now the FCC sets kind of the guidelines this out in the FCC OET Bulletin 65 which I have a link to on the hamwhisper.com website. So take a look at that but the, the steps that you must take as an amateur to ensure compliance with RF safety regulations is you must perform a routine RF exposure evaluation. What type of instrument can be used to accurately measure an RF field? Well, the instrument that you would use is a calibrated field strength meter with a calibrated antenna. So we talked about this in some previous lessons, but a field strength meter measures the strength of RF radiation, and you can use a field strength meter to, to map the radiation pattern of your antenna in addition to finding out how much RF energy is, is floating around in your ham shack. So a, a field strength meter will tell you how much R, RF energy is in and around your shack and thus can help you figure exposure levels. So the instrument that you would use to accurately measure an RF field is a calibrated field strength meter with a calibrated antenna. What do the RF safety rules require when the maximum power output capability of an otherwise compliant station is reduced? The answer is no further action is required. So basically what we're talking about here is that you have a station and you've basically taken an evaluation of how much RF energy it, you're exposing people to at a certain power level. Decided to reduce that power level. So therefore you are essentially, by reducing the power level, you are reducing the amount of RF energy that that, that station is producing. So if you're already in compliance with the RF safety rules at a higher power, Reducing the power is not going to do anything worse than what you were doing before. So this is a common sense answer. So no further action is required if you are reducing the maximum power output capability in an otherwise compliant station. What precautions should you take if you install an indoor transmitting antenna? Well, the precaution you need to take is to make sure that MPE limits are not exceeded in occupied areas. So basically, whenever you put an antenna near occupied areas to include inside a building, you need to be kind of careful. And the potential for uh, the close proximity of the antenna to the people has the potential for exceeding maximum permissible exposure limits. 
So essentially, if you put an antenna indoors, you want to make sure that you do a good solid valuation that and be sure that you are not exposing you or the rest of your family or your neighbors upstairs or downstairs to an excessive amount of RF energy. So you want to make sure that MPE limits are not exceeded in occupied areas. What precautions should you take whenever you make adjustments or repairs to an antenna? The answer is you want to turn off the transmitter and disconnect the feed line. And this, if you think about it a little deeper, makes sense because you'll have a very bad day if you are fiddling with your antenna and someone transmits a single signal on your radio. And that signal gets radiated through the antenna you're fiddling with and then you get uh, RF burn, shocked, or fall from your antenna. As most electronic repair pursuits, turn everything off and disconnect the antenna when you're doing work on an antenna. What precautions should be taken when installing a ground-mounted antenna? Now this kind of goes back to the theme of what you should do if you install an indoor antenna. The answer is it should be installed so no one can be exposed to RF radiation in excess of maximum permissible limits. So the point is that people and animals can potentially come in close proximity to a ground-mounted antenna. It's right there on the ground, people can walk by it, you know, hang out, whatever. So take the appropriate measures to make sure that no one gets a good blast of RF, RF energy in excess of MPE limits. So you want to install a ground-mounted antenna so that no one can be exposed to RF radiation in excess of maximum permissible exposure limits. What is one thing that can be done if the valuation shows that a neighbor might receive more than the allowable limit of RF exposure from the main lobe of a directional antenna? The answer is take precautions to ensure that the antenna cannot be pointed at their house. And this is a pretty common sense basic answer. It's the same thing if you had a gun and you didn't want to shoot your neighbor, don't point your gun at your neighbor. So in order to avoid zapping your neighbor with a bunch of unnecessary RF energy, you don't point the antenna at your neighbor. So if your neighbor happens to be in the way of the station you're trying to contact with your directional antenna, move the antenna someplace else so it's not blasting through your neighbor's house. How can you determine that your station complies with FCC RF exposure regulations? The answers are by calculation based on FCC OET Bulletin 65, by calculation based on computer modeling, and by measurement of field strength using calibrated equipment. And yes, this is an all of the above answer on the exam. And any one of these or combination of these three answers will meet FCC RF exposure regulations. And I said it before, but if you haven't read the FCC OET Bulletin 65, you probably should. I have a link to it on the hamwhisperer.com website, so stop by and check it out. And that's the end of the review, and it's time for the G08 quiz. So take out a pencil and a piece of paper in number 1 through 15. When you're done with the quiz, you can stop by hamwhisper.com and check your answers under the exam answers page. You'll find it under the G0A section. And I will be going through the questions pretty quickly, so if you need more time, just pause the video. And with that out of the way, let's get started with the quiz. Question 1. What is one way that RF energy can affect human body tissue? A. It heats body tissue. B. It causes radiation poisoning. C. It causes the blood count to reach a dangerously low level or D, it cools body tissue. Question two, which property is not important in estimating if an RF signal exceeds the maximum permissible exposure or MPE? A, it's duty cycle, B, it's critical angle, C, it's power density, or D, it's frequency? Question three, which of the following has the most direct effect on the permitted exposure level of RF radiation? A, the age of the person exposed, B, the power level and frequency of the energy, C, the environment near the transmitter, or D, the type of transmission line used. Question 4. What does time averaging mean in reference to RF radiation exposure? A, the average time of day when the exposure occurs, B, the average time it takes RF radiation to have any long-term effect on the body, C, the total time of the exposure, or D, the total RF exposure averaged over a certain time. Question 5. What must you do if an evaluation of your station shows RF energy radiated from your station exceeds permissible limits? A, take action to prevent human exposure to the excessive RF fields. B, file an environmental impact statement, EIS 97 with the FCC. 
C. Secure written permission from your neighbors to operate above the controlled MPE limits. Or D. All of these answers are correct. Question 6. Which transmitter or transmitters at a multiple user site is or are responsible for RF safety compliance? A. Only the most powerful transmitter on site. B. All transmitters on site regardless of the power level or duty cycle. C. Any transmitter that contributes 5% or more of the MPE. Or D. Only those that operate at more than 50% duty cycle. Question 7. What effect does transmitter duty cycle have when evaluating RF exposure? A. A lower transmitter duty cycle permits greater short-term exposure levels. B. A higher transmitter duty cycle permits greater short-term exposure cycles. C. Low duty cycle transmitters are exempt from RF exposure evaluation requirements. Or D. Only those transmitters that operate at 100% duty cycle must be evaluated. Question 8. Which of the following steps must an amateur operator take to ensure compliance with RF safety regulations? A. Post a copy of FCC Part 97 in the station. B. Post a copy of OET bolts in 65 in the station. C. Perform a routine RF exposure evaluation. Or D. All of these choices are correct. Question 9. What type of instrument can be used to accurately measure an RF field? A. A receiver with an S-meter. B. A calibrated field strength meter with a calibrated antenna. C. A beta scope with a dummy antenna calibrated at 50 ohms. Or D. An oscilloscope with a high stability crystal marker generator. Question 10. What do the RF safety rules require when the maximum power output capability of an otherwise compliant station is reduced? A. Filing of the changes with the FCC. B. Recording the power level changes in the log or station records. C. Performance of a routine RF exposure evaluation. Or D. No further action is required. Question 11. What precautions should you take if you install an indoor transmitting antenna? A. Locate the antenna close to your operating position to minimize feed line radiation. B. Position the antenna along the edge of a wall to reduce parasitic radiation. C. Make sure that MPE limits are not exceeded in occupied areas or D, no special precautions are necessary if single sideband and CW are the only modes used. Question 12. What precautions should you take whenever you make adjustments or repairs to an antenna? A, ensure that you and the antenna structure are grounded. B, turn off the transmitter and disconnect the feed line. C, wear a radiation badge. Or D, all of these answers are correct. Question 13. What precautions should be taken when installing a ground-mounted antenna? A. It should not be installed higher than you can reach. B. It should not be installed in a wet area. C. It should be painted so people or animals do not accidentally run into it. Or D. It should be installed so no one can be exposed to RF radiation in excess of maximum permissible limits. Question 14. What is one thing that can be done if evaluation shows that a neighbor might receive more than the allowable limit of RF exposure from the main lobe of a directional antenna? A. Change from horizontal polarization to vertical polarization. B. Change from horizontal polar polarization to circular polarization. C. Use an antenna with a higher front-to-back ratio. Or D. Take precautions to ensure that the antenna cannot be pointed at their house. And question 15. How can you determine that your station complies with FCC RF exposure regulations? A. By calculation based on FCC OET Bulletin 65. B. By calculation based on computer modeling. C. By measurement of field strength using calibrated equipment. Or D. All of these choices are correct. And that's it for the G08 quiz and lesson 34. So now that you're done with the quiz, be sure to stop by hamwhisper.com to check your answers. You can find them under the exam answers page under the G0A section of questions. And until next time and lesson 35, the last lesson in the general exam course, this is Andy, KE4GKP, saying 73, and I hope to hear you on the air soon.